since I know we're a little particularly late today, but uh, I wanted to wait until after the Secretary's meeting. Uh, so let me start by just giving a readout of that. Uh, Secretary uh, Kerry met today with Syrian Opposition Coalition President Jarba at the Department of State. Uh, he and President Jarba had a productive discussion on the full range of our shared concerns in Syria, including empowering the moderate political and armed opposition, curbing the rise of extremism, completing the work of removing chemical weapons, and easing humanitarian suffering. As part of our continued efforts to bolster the moderate Syrian opposition and help the coalition serve the interests of all Syrians, the Secretary also discussed with President Jarba some additional measures we are taking to support the co coalition, local communities inside Syria, and members of the moderate armed opposition. These steps include our announcement that the coalition's representative offices in the United States are now foreign missions, working with Congress to provide more than $27 million in new non-lethal assistance to the Syrian opposition, stepping up deliveries of non-lethal assistance to commanders in the Free Syrian Army to enhance their logistical capabilities, and imposing new sanctions and restrictions announced earlier today by the Department of Treasury against members of the regime and its supporters who have suppressed the Syrian people. Additionally, the Secretary reaffirmed to President Jarba that the United States remains committed to working towards a negotiated political solution that puts an end to the violence and ultimately leads to a representative government that is responsive to the needs of the Syrian people. The United States has led the international community's efforts to advance a political transition, and the Secretary commended the coalition's commitment to that goal. Uh, with that, Lara? Could you bring us up to speed on where the administration feels um, about arming the rebels or sending lethal aid to the moderate um, rebel groups? Is there uh, more impetus to do this now uh, that he is here and, I believe, directly asking for it? Uh, well, we've certainly uh, seen his public comments, and uh, certainly he made the same uh, case he's made uh, pu publicly in private. Um, you, uh, we provide a range of assistance to the Syrian opposition, uh, including uh, non-lethal assistance. We just announced an increase in that, including humanitarian assistance. We continue to be the largest donor uh, in the world. Uh, as you know, uh, part of our effort has been to continue to uh, boost uh, the moderate opposition and provide additional um, assistance, in t including to uh, the moderate uh, armed opposition. I'm not going to outline that or detail that uh, from here, uh, but uh, we continue to uh, consider uh, a range of options. I have nothing to convey or announce for all of you today. Okay, so there's still, it's fair to say that the administration is still debating um, whether or not to give lethal aid to the moderate opposition. As you know, uh, in the past we have uh, announced our uh, plans, you know, last year, I should say, uh, to expand the scale and scope of our aid. I have nothing new on that front to announce. Obviously, discussions are, are ongoing. Thank you. The argument that was put forward yesterday by um, Mr. Jarba that the um, Syrian rebels um, opposition needs um, what he called more efficient and more effective weaponry to particularly to combat um, barrel bombs, which he said they're um, being rained down on his um, people daily now. Do you have any sympathy with the argument? Well, certainly we have sympathy, not just sympathy, but um, we, we watch uh, alongside them in horror as we see what's happening on the ground, whether that's uh, recent attacks in Aleppo, uh, the uh, uh, efforts uh, by the regime to block humanitarian assistance, to starve uh, people to death uh, within the country. So it's more than just sympathy. It's, it's what is in fact, uh, driving us to continue to have ongoing discussions, both with the opposition today, but even next week uh, when the Secretary goes to meet with members of the London 11. I think his contention is, though, without heavy weaponry of some kind, the opposition uh, is in a position where it's very difficult for them to change the balance of power on the ground. And unless there's a shift in the balance of power on the ground, you're not going to open the door towards any kind of political solution. Well, Joe, uh, you're familiar with our view, and something actually members of uh, Jarba's own coalition repeated today is that there is not a military uh, solution here to what's happening on the ground. We continue to believe that, as you know. We understand what their requests are. Uh, as I noted, uh, we're continuing to build the capacity of the moderate opposition, including through the provision of assistance to vetted members of the moderate armed opposition. I'm not going to outline that further, but obviously discussions are ongoing about how to uh, take steps to change the 
uh, situation on the ground, and that was part of the discussion today, and will be next week when the Secretary is in London. Just more, one more. I mean, I, yes, they do agree that there's no military solution, and mm -hmm. they are seeking a political solution. But I think their contention is wider, is broader than that. That if you don't give them a, a big stick, if you like, to help them convince the Assad regime that they will not win this war, um, even if they don't, they, they they need this, even if they're not going to use it. Well, there's a, obviously that's part of the discussion uh, that they have presented, and they've made the same arguments they've made publicly and private, and I'm sure that will continue as they meet with uh, other members of the administration and members on Capitol Hill. But uh, again, I don't have anything new to announce for all of you It's today. not enough to sway your reluctance to provide them with heavy weaponry, though. I have nothing, uh, nothing to announce in terms of any change in our, our position. A clarification uh, mm -hmm. on, the, uh, on the aid that you announced. The $27 million, is that strictly for humanitarian aid, or does that include the aid that is also going to the FSA commanders? Uh, it's uh, $27 million. I, I believe we outlined it pretty specifically uh, when we announced it uh, to the Syrian opposition. I, uh, it, I don't, it includes uh, non-lethal assistance to commanders in the Free Sy Syrian Army to enhance their logistical capabilities, so it does include that, Raz. Okay. Well, what can we expect from uh, London 11 meeting next week? What we can you expect from the London 11 meeting? Well. Um, as I've noted and has been announced, I believe, on the ground, the Secretary will be traveling. We'll have an official notice, uh, I'm sure, in the next 24 hours or so. Uh, but he'll be traveling to London next week, uh, where he will participate in, participate in the UK-hosted ministerial meeting of the core group of the Friends of the Syrian People, uh, also known as the London 11. Uh, they will discuss the international community's efforts uh, to ease humanitarian suffering inside Syria, support for the moderate opposition, and uh, efforts to coordinate on advancing a political transition. Obviously, the Secretary will uh, communicate on his own meetings here and meetings the administration is having during the official delegation visit of the SOC, and other uh, members of the London 11 will certainly uh, communicate on uh, their meetings and their views and assistance that we're all uh, working on. And President Jarba has announced before he came to Washington that the opposition has started to receive sophisticated weapons from the West are you aware of uh, of this this kind of weapons that I've the opposition? I've seen those reports. Um, I don't have anything to outline further for you in terms of uh, our assistance. Syria, go ahead. Um, Syria and Russia coming together mm -hmm. here. Um, the Russian ministry is saying that Kerry and Lavrov spoke today. I was mm -hmm. wondering how much of the conversation um, was about Syria and about this meeting with Jarba. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, they spoke uh, prior to the meeting, uh, so it was uh, mainly focused on uh, Ukraine. Um, he uh, talked about, uh, the Secretary talked about, again, the importance of uh, de-escalation, disarming separatists, uh, steps uh, to evacuate buildings. Uh, they, uh, uh, he talked about the importance of, uh, of, of taking uh, specific steps uh, to move forward and agreeing on those, uh, support for uh, dialogues that are happening uh, around Ukraine and uh, efforts by the international community to support those uh, and reiterated the importance of the election. But the conversation was focused on Ukraine while I am on this topic. He also mm -hmm. spoke with Prime Minister Yatsenyuk uh, as well this morning, uh, encouraged him to continue uh, the broad inclusive dialogue uh, that is uh, the, uh, the legitimate government is supporting across Ukraine, uh, discussed ongoing preparatory efforts for the elections, uh, including how to ensure uh, that people across Ukraine have the ability to vote. Um, so he spoke with uh, both of them this morning. But sorry, Syria wasn't part of that. I know it was prior to Jarba, but it was the phone call was focused on Ukraine. It, it was not. It was it was all on Ukraine and not the Treasury designation that did not come up either. Uh, that was not. Russian no, that would not not probably be the proper channel for that to to happen through. Go ahead, Michael. What specific ways does the 27 million enhance the logistical capability of the opposition military commanders? In terms of how specifically? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it's a very good question. I know when we announced it, we had more details. Let me see if I have anything more in front here. And if not, Michael, we can get you something shortly after the briefing in terms of how it's broken down. Um, obviously, as you know, we've provided a range of uh, different tools in the past, equipment, et cetera. Um, if you so could just take it. I mean, mm -hmm. is it trucks? Is it radios? Yep. Is it, uh, Let me take it, and we'll get an answer around to all of you after you know. the briefing. Well, I just, mm -hmm. in, your, in your handout, when you talked about the $27 million, it was for 
what you specified was the activities of the opposition interim government type things like civil activities, rescue, that sort of thing. You didn't, so is that all coming out of that same pot? The, of the 27 million? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. so, it's, so it's that plus non-lethal assistance to the assessment. It's non. It's non-lethal assistance. Yes, yeah. it, but it goes to a range of, um, a range of, uh, re resources on the ground. But let me see if we can get a more complete no. breakdown. What portion of the twenty-seven mm -hmm. billion goes to the military commanders and what specifically sure. they're mm -hmm. getting? Understandable. Do we have any more on Syria? Should yeah. we move yeah, on to can we talk about? Go, just go yeah. ahead. Uh, sorry. Uh, Arab uh, foreign ministers will be meeting next uh, Monday uh, on Syria to discuss the deteriorating uh, situation there. Are you aware of this meeting, and uh, is there any coordination with the, uh, with the Arab states? There is certainly coordination with the Arab states. As you know, many of them are members of the London 11, so certainly part of their meetings next week will uh, be part of the discussion when the London 11 meets next week. And next, uh, last one for me, uh, do you have any... Uh, comment or reaction to the explosion in Aleppo today that targeted uh, a, a historical uh, uh, hotel? Uh, well, we have, um, of course, um, seen that report. Um, I believe uh, there's still information that is being um, gathered on that. Um, we, uh, we have nothing to confirm in terms of the source. Uh, we know that uh, in reports the Islamic Front has claimed responsibility, but again, nothing to confirm. Um, beyond that, obviously, any attack or any uh, uh, violence along these lines is something we would condemn in the strongest terms. Uh, Raz? Coming back to your point about uh, the sanctions, mm -hmm. several uh, cabinet level officers were cited, a presidential advisor, um, at least one Russian official who may have economic ties or banking ties, an energy facility in mm -hmm. homes. Can you give us more insight into why these particular people and this? Uh, business, why now? Uh, what is it the U.S. is trying to achieve by these particular sanctions? Well, uh, Roz, at this point, more than 200 individuals and entities have been sanctioned since the onset of uh, unrest in Syria. So this is just the latest uh, iteration of that. And these individuals, of course, um, specifically uh, uh, have been providing support to the regime, which is what the, uh, the uh, you know, what we are allowed to sanction under these uh, under this specific executive order. So, um, you know, I think Treasury put out a specific press release that goes individual by individual mm -hmm. and uh, what their ties are, and I would point you to that and the details there. But are you able to say anything more about, for example, the presidential advisor? I believe his name is Bassem Hassan. Do you have anything more that you can say again? From here? The Treasury press release has specifics on uh, the details as to why for each of these individuals. Broadly speaking, it's because of their support for the Syrian regime and uh, their uh, the atrocities that are happening on the ground. But I would point you to the specifics they've put out. Are you able to say whether at this point, every person in charge of a department or an agency? or is part of the unofficial cabinet, the advisory staff to President Assad has been sanctioned at this point, and if not, why not? Well, it's nearly 200 individuals and entities, so I don't have the list of who is not on that list, but obviously that is a very extensive and expansive list for, for obvious reasons. And then why not sanction Bashar al-Assad? Why not sanction his wife? Why not sanction their close relatives? especially given that most of her family is in the UK, is there a reason why you would not go after the head of a government that this administration has said should be out of power? Well, Roz, I, I certainly appreciate the question. As you know, we are uh, speak regularly about our views on how horrific the actions of uh, Assad and his family have been, um, but I'm not going to preview or give you any insight into any thinking uh, about future sanctions for obvious reasons. Uh, in, in the, in, internally in the government. Go ahead, Michael. Um, Jen, have, have uh, Russian individuals and Russian-based institutions previously been sanctioned with regard to Syria? Uh, that is a very good question. Uh, let me take that for you as well. Uh, two for you today, Michael, that I'm sure others are interested enough, in. This is the first time, yeah. and if, if it is, why now? Does it reflect general downturn in American-Russian relations. It does not. It is unrelated to this. Is, it's an entirely different executive order that deals with the situation in Ukraine. Uh, is not related to that. It is related to specifically their support for what's happening in Syria. But I can check historically if this okay. is the first it's time. a historical question. Mm -hmm. Sure. More on Syria? So new, new topic. Syria, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, the, the question was raised a few days ago about uh, do are they, this group 
going to, or this uh, status that they have now, allow them to have, beside talks with the uh, Americans, any international talks, I mean, with other people? Uh, like, like the UN, for example, are going to do work with the UN as representative of the opposition? Uh, my understanding is no, but um, we can check if you have other questions about what we announced a couple of days ago, yeah. Uh, new topic? Sure. I wondered if um, you had any reaction to the news today from the pro-Russian militias that said that they're going to ignore President Putin's words and go ahead anyway and organize a referendum on Sunday? Well, uh, as you know, we don't recognize the legitimacy or uh, of this referendum. Um, we've seen the comments of uh, President Putin, but as I said yesterday, it's more than just comments we need. We need actions. We still continue to believe that uh, the Russian government has an ability to influence uh, what the separatists are doing on the ground, so uh, we'll look to see if that uh, happens over the coming days. Have you seen any evidence that the Russian troops have pulled back from the border We have so not. Far? No. Um, back on that call, um, when was the last time that Lavrov and Kerry spoke? There had been some gap in there, right? Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can check and get you an answer on that, Margaret. Um, let's see. Uh, they spoke on Saturday? Oh, that's right. Mm -hmm. um, Are there any plans as a secretary in Europe for him to have a meeting with Lavrov? The, the details of the trip are still coming together. Uh, obviously, there is an overlap with a number of the London 11 members uh, in terms of their role in supporting efforts in Ukraine, but uh, at this point it's not scheduled, but we're still working on the schedule. It's coming together. Well, to the, uh, people who uh, say that they're going ahead with the referenda on Sunday, have Ambassador Pyatt and his staff been in touch with any of these people at all in Donetsk and Luhansk? Are you able to the read The separatists? Out? Yeah, the separatists. Have, have there been any U.S. contact to try to persuade them why the U.S. thinks these referenda would be a bad idea? I, I'm not Oh, not that I'm aware of in terms of directly with the separatists. I, I'm happy to check on that. Obviously, yes, I just stated again our view yes. that, of course, the Russian government has a has strong role to play here in, in terms of influencing their actions. Jen, um, the uh, president of the OSC presented the their OSCE roadmap to uh, President Putin and to the Russian side. Mm -hmm. um, what's your view of the roadmap? Uh, what do you think it is it it's pluses and minuses, and do you think it's a basis for making headway in this um, mm -hmm. conflict? Well, uh, we certainly welcome the efforts of the international community and a broad range of entities in the international community to uh, put forward ideas uh, to support peace and security in Ukraine. Uh, we've received the proposed draft roadmap, uh, are uh, developed by the OSCE's chairman, uh, and we're uh, studying and reviewing that. Uh, and obviously there are ongoing discussions uh, with a range of European uh, officials, a range of uh, OSCE officials about what the best steps forward are. The, Go ahead. I just wondered if, um, peripherally, if you had any reaction to the news that uh, President Putin is planning to attend the D-Day celebrations in, um, uh, in June next month. Uh, well, our current differences uh, over Ukraine notwithstanding, uh, the fact remains that the United States, the United Kingdom, France, the Soviet Union, uh, and many others united 70 years ago uh, to defeat uh, Nazism. And this was a historic victory. Uh, and those who sacrificed to bring peace uh, to Europe deserve to be honored as part of that. Uh, in Ukraine? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Uh, John, uh, you <coughs> uh, told repeatedly that the U.S. will not recognize the Crimea joining in Russia. So uh, you consider now Crimea Ukrainian territory. Do you think, but I bet that... Part of uh, Ukraine, yeah. yes. Uh, but I bet uh, 25th May election won't be held in, won't be held <laughs> in Crimea. Uh, do you think that... Mm, Actually, hurts oh, go ahead, I, but I do have... Do you think that on. hurts, uh, anyway, uh, the legitimacy of the elections? And secondly, you mentioned that uh, uh, OSC, OSC is working on, uh, and the Ukrainian authorities are working to give an opportunity to vote to every Ukrainian in every part of mm -hmm. Ukraine. Uh, so does this include Crimea? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very good question. Let me touch on a, a little bit of what's happening with election preparations. Um, the OSCE's election uh, monitoring agency, uh, ODIR, has already deployed 100 long-term observers to Ukraine. Uh, they will also deploy 900 short-term observers on May 20th, uh, which will be the largest ODIR monitoring mission in the organization's history. 
the United States will provide approximately one-tenth of the observers. Uh, and these 1,000 observers will be joined by more than 100 members of the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly, including some members of Congress. Uh, the OSCE monitors will uh, complement the work of thousands of Ukraine-based observers who are also deploying across uh, the country. The, the government of Ukraine has also modified the presidential election law to allow for domestic monitoring organizations to participate as well. And finally, the U United States is providing a total of $11.4 million to support free and fair elections in Ukraine. In terms of Crimea, uh, the RADA passed special legislation to allow Ukrainian citizens of Crimea to temporarily change their voting place for the purposes of the May 25th election, allowing them to vote at polling stations in the mainland portion of Ukraine. Uh, so the government of Ukraine will set up additional stations in the south to accommodate Crimean voters. Uh, we call on the Russian government uh, and Crimean authorities to allow Ukrainian citizens in Crimea uh, the ability to travel and participate in the vote on May 25th. And, uh, well, but the Russian government may allow, but uh, <coughs> will they, uh, well, they can be thousands and tens of thousands of people, will they be able to travel and to, do they have money for, <laughs> for that? Well, uh, again, it's it's uh, they're ta making every taking every step possible to provide them the opportunity, and obviously, uh, if the Russians are open to uh, the Ukrainian voices, the people, the voice of the Ukrainian people being heard, they can allow for people to to vote um, across the country of Ukraine. What members of Congress are going to be part of that uh, parliamentary observer delegation? Uh, I believe. Um, I, I think they're talking about internally, but let me check on that and okay. see what, if there's more specifics. Go ahead. Just following up on election preparations, mm -hmm. could you talk a little bit about the security aspect of that and to what extent the U.S. will be supporting that given the sort of ongoing violence and unrest in the East? Well, again, uh, I mentioned the uh, money that we've been providing, the number of observers we've been providing. I will check and see if there's more details beyond that. Right, because a lot has been made about observers and, you know, aggregate sums mm -hmm. of money, but given the sort of potential for attacks and violence and things like that. Well, let me be clear, and this is an important point. Most of Ukraine is very calm. Uh, there are some isolated areas that we talk about frequently for good reason, Slovyansk, Luhansk, etc., where there are separatists that are taking over buildings and, and wreaking uh, havoc, of course. Sure. But Sorry, most of Ukraine been... is, is calm, and, and the elections will... Uh, there'll be no issue with them moving forward. I was asking specifically about eastern and, and southeastern Ukraine. Sorry. I, didn't I will see if beyond the money and the observers, there's more specifics uh, that we will be providing. Thank you. Uh, more in Ukraine? Okay. New topic? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, this morning, uh, Secretary Kerry was meeting uh, Amr Musa. Mm -hmm. in, uh, he, of course, you defined him as a former Arab League uh, director, but he's in uh, his uh, advisor job to the the candidate or the presidency. What Do you have a readout of the meeting? Uh, let me see if I can get you a little more of a readout. Um, but let, obviously, they, they, as you stated, did have a meeting this morning. They have a long-standing standing relationship. Uh, this most recent meeting was an opportunity to discuss a range of bilateral and regional issues, including Egypt's uh, ongoing uh, transition. But we will uh, talk with our team and see if we can get a few more details from the meeting. Yes, uh, the other question related two days ago, uh, the General Sisi was on TV and in an interview. Of course, he's a candidate now, but may, probably will be the president. He was asked about the future of uh, Muslim Brotherhood, and he said it's finished. Do you have anything to say about that? Well, we continue to encourage uh, an inclusive political process uh, that respects the fundamental human rights of all Egyptians. Uh, ultimately, we believe a transition, not just a presidential election, but a broad transition to in an inclusive and sustainable democracy uh, needs to respect freedoms, permit dissent, and foster an inclusive political process. And that is necessary to supporting Egypt's long-term stability uh, and success. So democracy is more than a vote at a, at a ballot box, uh, and we'll certainly be watching it with that in mind. It's about equal rights and protection of universal freedoms of speech, assembly and press, uh, rule of law, accountability, and, and of course inclusivity. Yes, in the same interview, when he was asked about the Egyptian-American relations, he mentioned that uh, sometimes you are looking to things going on in the States with American eyes, and we hope that American officials look to what's something happening in Egypt with Egyptian eyes. Do you agree with this categorization of looking to things different way? Well, I think certainly we look at things, uh, some issues, like 
uh, freedom of speech and uh, rights uh, of, of public uh, discourse and assembly uh, through universal uh, eyes throughout across the world. And uh, those are some of the areas where we've expressed concerns. But uh, we, as you know, value our long-term relationship with Egypt and have made some, taken some steps in recent weeks in that regard. Uh, Amru Musa, when he was moving around in this town, many places he mentioned the idea of or the description of Egyptian-American relations that there is a now a new page in it. Uh, but first, uh, what do you think if, I mean, I, I, I ask him what he means by new page, but I'm trying to figure out if you see there is a new page or it's the same old page. Well, I would ask him, uh, but certainly the Egypt is going through an important transition, as they have been for several years. Uh, we know uh, democracy and the transition to a long-term sustainable democracy takes time. Uh, and obviously, we've expressed concerns where we have them, but we continue to value our long-term strategic relationship. And, and so we, we're continuing to work uh, closely with them in that regard. Yeah, there is another one, which is the last question, I hope. Okay. <laughs> or you hope. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. It's, it's related to... But uh, the, your counter, Egyptian counterpart, the spokesperson of the foreign ministry, I usually use this, the same experience, uh, the expression counterpart. Okay. So he was mentioning yesterday that the uh, Egyptian foreign ministry, let's say, approved the name of a new ambassador and uh, probably soon will be announced from the White House or anything. Do you have uh, the new ambassador to Egypt? And some of already Reuters and others there already put his name. Do you have anything to say, or I have to say, uh, you are going to say to me, wait for the White House? That is right. You, you know this, this job well. The White House makes uh, any of those announcements, so I would defer to them. I have nothing to announce today. Sure. Mm -hmm. Both Amr Musa and before him, Foreign Minister Fahmi came to Washington and they said, um, you know, we want democracy, we are working for a new democratic government, but mm -hmm. at the same time they were very defensive over the criticism of the, the rule of law, the recent detentions of mm -hmm. journalists, of the, you know, the, the death sentences for hundreds of people. Mm -hmm. and, and they insist that this is part of their law, but you know, it, it's never going to stand. I mean, these, especially the, the death sentences were never going to stand. I'm just wondering, do you all buy that? I mean, it seems like they want to have it both ways. This is a democratic government, and we have these laws, but don't pay any attention to these laws because they'll never stand. Well, our view, uh, Laura, is that um, to build a prosperous democratic future, uh, Egypt needs to uh, respect fundamental freedoms and universal human rights. And those include uh, many of the issues you've mentioned, whether that's rule of law or uh, respect for media freedom, respect for assembly. And um, the, again, I'll, we'll, we, will, we will circle back on the uh, Amr Musa meeting, but uh, from the FAMI meeting, those are issues that the secretary pressed um, when he was in the meeting because uh, there are not really different definitions of what those are. And uh, we've raised concerns about them in the past. Um, as you know, there are additional certifications uh, that will require steps, uh, additional steps by the Egyptian government. And uh, not only do we press it, we'll be, we'll be watching what they do moving forward. So basically, your position is that, you know, it's the law, the letter of the law that needs to be um, either respected or changed, right? I mean, it, it doesn't really matter if there's these excuses or this justification that some of these things will never stand. It's fair to assume that the U.S. has problems with the letter of the law as they're written, correct? Well, the, 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 the um, extrajudicial, uh, you know, the practices that are happening uh, on the ground, I mean, we could outline them for some time about the arrests and the sentencing and uh, you know, how journalists are being treated, how protesters are being treated. Um, so regardless of what, um, of what is conveyed, I mean, our view is, is fairly universal on some of these issues. And, uh, you know, we believe they need to do more in order to continue on the path to a democratic transition. Do you think that would include changing some of these laws? I, I, not that I might have to talk to our team about whether that's uh, what we're calling for, but obviously uh, abiding by... Uh, respect for a range of these practices may not even require a, a law. It's about uh, how you respect human rights and, uh, and freedom of speech. Yeah, I mean, the way that they explain it, especially when it comes to the sentencing, is that this is what the, the, the judges are legally required to do mm -hmm. because some of the defendants weren't there in court mm -hmm. and blah, blah, blah. And so, I mean, it raises, I think, a, a fundamental question over, you know, 
if you support democracy, how can you support these laws? Well, there are some laws we've spoken about, like the NGO law, for example, where we've expressed concern about it, and obviously we don't feel it should stand. Um, I'll check and see if there are others that we can reference. Uh, go ahead. Can we go to Nigeria? Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Um, uh, Secretary Kerry noted this morning that the team, the American team, is hitting the ground today, mm -hmm. or now, and uh, he called on the international community to focus their attention on fighting uh, Boko Haram. I wanted to go back to a question that was asked yesterday, but sort of uh, maybe add some more depth to it. Um, you were asked whether why it had taken so long to designate Boko Haram as a mm -hmm. as an FTO, and um, I don't know if you've seen a story that's out today um, in an online publication that, in fact, Secretary Clinton who I know was before your time, but um, she and the State Department at that point, um, back in 2011, 2012, fought against CIA, Justice Department, other advice to designate uh, Boko Haram as an FTO, which I believe gives law enforcement agencies certain powers that they can then go in and start helping. W what is your reaction to, to that? Why, why did the Secretary... Did, was that true, that she refused the advice of other agencies within the, uh, within the administration? And if so, why? Well, I'm obviously not going to uh, discuss internal debates, especially those that happened uh, years ago. But under Secretary Clinton, I would remind you, we did designate three Boko Haram leaders in 2012. Uh, that was an important step, one that the United States was uh, forward on, one that um, uh, did put in place um, uh, some uh, resulting uh, actions. Uh, and obviously, there's a long process that goes to determining uh, whether you should designate. But I think an important reminder here is designations are just one tool uh, we use to fight terrorism. Uh, there are a range of steps, uh, including under Secretary Clinton, that Secretary Kerry has have continued uh, stepping up counterterrorism cooperation with uh, not just the Nigerian government, but other governments in northern Africa, um, you know, stepping up other resources that we can provide and work with uh, teams on the ground to do. So this is just one tool, but uh, but there were many steps that were taken given the rising concern about Boko Haram, and we've only seen uh, a lot of the uh, horrific actions that they've taken, unfortunately, increase uh, over the course of the last uh, several months. But do you feel you lost a couple of years? I mean, the, 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 the big attack where they first really came to international notice was, although they've been around a while before, that was in 2011 when they bombed a UN building in Abuja. Abuja. Mm -hmm. um, did you lose a couple of years by not focusing attention on Boko Haram in their sense? Have, did they, they were a very nebulous, shadowy kind of organization. Mm -hmm. These two years, did it allow them to regroup, and has that um, in some way hampered the fight that you're now going to have on your hands? No, because a designating, a designating an organization as a foreign terrorist organization is just one tool. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, the rise of Boko Haram, uh, their uh, increasing acts of terrorism uh, around Africa is something that we've been watching closely. Uh, it's something that Secretary Clinton and her team were watching closely. Obviously, with the uh, tragic events uh, with the kidnapping of the Nigerian girls, the world is now watching this, including many across the United States uh, more closely. And it does, uh, which is why the Secretary raised this this morning, uh, raise a, a spotlight on uh, this issue and one that we are, despite the tragedy, happy to have on it, given uh, how horrific these events have been and how concerned we are about uh, their proliferation over the over the last several months and years. Jen, on, on this, the um one of the debates at the time, at least had by many experts, mm -hmm. not necessarily within the building, was that by designating the entire organization, not just the individuals, that it would in some ways be used or manipulated by the Nigerian military, which mm -hmm. is notoriously brutal, mm -hmm. um, and that it would be used perhaps for them to go in and just carry out massive human rights abuses beyond what they've already been accused of. Does this building no longer have that sense or assessment or concern about the Nigerian military, given that we're now talking about them perhaps needing to carry out a hostage rescue operation? Do we no longer have these concerns about their abuses? Well, again, I think, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, I think when we designated Boko Haram in November, we talked about this a little bit in terms of our concerns and how assistance would be provided uh, as a result of that. You know, that hasn't changed, but also the Nigerian government naturally has the lead uh, in this process. Uh, the secretary, as you know, uh, and other members of the administration have been working closely with them. Uh, he's spoken with uh, President Goodluck Jonathan. I, I don't have anything new today to tell you on that, but in several times in recent days, and that will continue. And uh, our view is that 
Um, obviously, this event uh, is, is, is so tragic and horrific. Uh, we need to do everything we can, as you've heard President Obama say, to, to provide uh, all the resources we can to bring the girls home. So has a level of confidence on part of this building in the abilities of the Nigerian military and government gone up? Since then? I'm not going to do a grading of that, uh, but obviously these the concerns are, persist, though, is what you were saying. Nothing has the, changed about that, and our limitations on aid and how we provide it hasn't changed. But at the same time, uh, President Goodluck Jonathan has been open to and embraced our offer of assistance in recent days. Our team, as the Secretary said, has begun to arrive on the ground. Uh, I know someone asked yesterday about the size. There are, uh, and I think DOD has provided some numbers in, in a variety of ways. I think. One thing to remember is that there are already dozens, if not more than that, uh, people on the ground who can be put in place to assist. Obviously, we're sending more. So it's safe to say that the numbers of people who will be assisting from the United States are in the dozens. Uh, the exact numbers will determine over the course of the coming days. Do you Go know ahead. when um, President Goodluck Jonathan uh, first requested USAID for, um, to rescue some of these girls? My understanding is that there was some lapse on that, that that hadn't happened immediately. Uh, that's accurate. Uh, as you uh, heard the Secretary say yesterday, in order to provide assistance and the resources that the United States government has, you need to have a willing partner. And obviously, um, you know, time is of the essence, and it's been now 24, 25 days uh, since these girls were abducted, but we're going to move as quickly as possible at this so point. If he said that yesterday, does that mean that? Nigeria formally asked for the assistant as, assistance as recently as in the last well, 24 we hours? Well, we offered and it was accepted. Do you know exactly when? Uh, when we, when the secretary spoke with uh, the Nigerian president uh, two days ago, I believe. Okay. All right, thanks. Do you know sure. whether this uh, building has uh, talked with counterparts in Cameroon or in in Chad, perhaps given the proximity to their borders on mm -hmm. expanding this cooperation and trying to recover the girls? Uh, we have, uh, as we've noted in the past, um, we have been concerned about. Um, uh, where uh, movement of the girls. Um, mm -hmm. Our embassies in Cameroon and Chad have been engaging with host governments ever since the abduction of Kurds several weeks ago. And, and also important to note for you, Lara, and mm -hmm. others, that uh, we've been closely engaged with the Nigerian government through our embassy on the ground as well for the last several weeks. It's just a determination of what additional new assistance beyond what we've been providing for some time now. Have there been any discussion about uh, forming similar teams in those countries with consultation from Abuja on, you know, expanding the search, as it were, or has it gotten to that point yet? Well, Roz, obviously with our teams on the ground and our team additional resources that will be going, that will be the uh, coordinating entities. So uh, beyond that, if there are needs to expand into other areas, into one, uh, it, I'm sure it will be coordinated through there. I'm sure this has been an asked no, go ahead. previously, but is the U.S. assistance that's coming now or the team that's getting on the ground now, is that specific to the schoolgirls' mm -hmm. um, rescue? I mean, as you know, there's so much violence that's continuing beyond that. It is, kind but, of but it's that. also important to note that long before this uh, and before we designated Boko Haram, we have been increasing our level of assistance, uh, coordination on counterterrorism efforts, intel sharing, uh, before this specific team went to the ground. But, but did that – was that people on the ground? Sorry. Was that actually American units or, or personnel on the ground at well, that Well, as you remember, I mean, we have an expansive team in Nigeria uh, that works at our embassy from a range of agencies that's been coordinating. Um, I outlined this a little bit the other day, but um, prior to um, – Prior to uh, the announcement just two days ago, we had already been uh, providing a range of assistance, uh, including uh, to Nigeria, including um, information sharing, um, uh, efforts to improve Nigeria's forensics and investigative capacity. Uh, our assistance also stresses the importance of protecting civilians and ensuring human rights are protected. Uh, we work with them to strengthen their criminal justice system, increase confidence in the government by supporting its efforts to hold those responsible for violence accountable. Um, we've uh, we're been working with the military to improve, the Nigerian military, to improve its professional uh, military education, bolster counter IED capacity, carry out responsible CT operations. Uh, last year we also provided uh, an additional uh, approximately $3 million in law enforcement assistance to Nigeria. So point being, we have been providing assistance. This is specific to the events that happened uh, just a few weeks ago. Can Go ahead, Joe. Um, is only one tool. Um, I'd like to get your reaction 
um, where Congressman Patrick Meehan in 2011 urged the Secretary to designate Boko Haram uh, as a terrorist organization. And he said that had we done it two years ago, we have been uh, able to use U.S. Um, resources to disrupt and track activities, and that he says we lost two years of increased scrutiny. I think I already answered the specific question about two years ago and why we designated and what we did. Go ahead, Elise. No, I'm, just, I'm kind of just sorry. Um, back in 2012, there was a uh, Nigerian-U.S. strategic dialogue that mm -hmm. happened here. And there was um, a meeting over at the USIP um, at which I specifically asked the question to the Nigerian representatives who were there. I, I think it was a foreign minister. My memory's fading me. Mm -hmm. um, about um, what their position was on designating Boko Haram. And his reply was that they weren't ready yet. And what actually was needed was better development in the north and the, to address those kinds of issues. Mm -hmm. Was there, in 2012, a reluctance on the part of the Nigerian authorities because I assume you consult with people before you go ahead and do a designation um, to take at least get their ideas on board. Um, was there a reluctance by the Nigerian authorities to have an FTO designation because they believed it would give maybe more of a status to Boko Haram than they wanted? I just don't have any other additional insight to offer in terms of two years ago and, and what the factors were. There's a range of factors. There's a long process, as you know. As you also know, and I noted, Two years ago, we did designate certain individual leaders, um, but I don't have any any other insight to provide on that. Because I think that goes to the issue about whether, you know, uh, whether it was blocked at this building or whether it was blocked in by the authorities in Nigeria as to why this group for two years has been allowed to um, operate with impunity so far. Well, again, and I think what you touched on there is the fact that there are a range of tools and a range of coordinated efforts that you work with any country on, or in the case of any uh, concerning organization, whether it's been designated or not, uh, to, to, to prevent uh, extremist uh, actions from happening. And that doesn't all require uh, designating an organization as a foreign terrorist organization. We've been working with Nigeria. We will continue to. But we have been before the official designation in November. Okay. John, can I, wait, can I um, go ahead? On the um, idea that over the last two years, I mean, if you've been providing all of this assistance and working with the Nigerians on mm -hmm. Boko Haram, regardless of any type of, of designation, how come the group has grown in such strength? I mean, are you saying that you haven't provided enough assistance, that the government hasn't been able to utilize or doesn't have the capacity? I mean, I mean, you would think that if you've been providing all this increased assistance over the last years, it would have made a difference in a positive direction, and, and certainly the, the trends on the ground have been, um, have been the opposite of that. Well, Elise, no one thinks, and you heard the Secretary say this morning, that there needs to be more focus from the global community. No one thinks that because the United States designated an organization as a terrorist organization and that we're providing assistance, that we can alone uh, prevent the growth of of, uh, of that extremist group. Obviously, there needs to be a broad effort, an international effort. Uh, there needs to be coordination on the ground. And certainly, there's more focus and attention on uh, the, the uh, risks or the challenges posed uh, and the threats, I should say, uh, from Boko Haram. And, and perhaps that will, that will uh, gain more, more interest and more support from the international community. I'm not even talking about the designation now. I'm just talking about um, even before these girls were kidnapped, I mean, there have been, over the last years, this group has been growing in strength, and why did it take the kidnapping of, of these girls, which is clearly, I mean, horrific and tragic, but there have been a lot of increased, you know, deadly attacks by Boko Haram over the last year. It didn't take it. That's why we've been working with the Nigerian government and in increasing our capacity building, increasing all of the areas I just outlined in response to Lara's question to help assist them in efforts to combat terrorism, including from Boko Haram, of course. So are you saying that the government still doesn't have enough capacity, that they haven't gone after the group with enough um, you know, fervor? I mean, what, why I, is the trend, any with all this increased, I'm just asking, like, mm -hmm. with all this increased assistance over the last however many years, and all this increased attention that you speak of, why are the trends going in the negative direction. Well, Elise, I, I can't analyze that for you other than to say it's a terrorist organization that we recently designated, we have growing have had growing concern about, uh, and that's why we're putting continue to increase continuing to increase our resources on it. Jen, um, Go ahead, I Ellie. knew that uh, you mentioned just a second ago that uh, a lot of the folks in this interagency team are already on the ground, but I just wanted to get clarification on what Secretary Kerry said this morning about mm -hmm. uh, the team 
hitting the ground now mm -hmm. was his exact words. So uh, was that a reference to other folks that are a part of this team who yes. are coming from the U.S. Mm -hmm. to Nigeria? Any uh, numbers you can give us or I don't have any specific that... numbers. Obviously, it's, it's you know, being worked through on a day-to-day -day basis, and they'll be in the dozens. Um, can you give us any granularity on what agencies are from or any State Department personnel among them, the USAID folks, or is it all AFRICOM? Uh, I don't have any other specific detail. We will see if there's more we can share with all of you. Go ahead. A uh, different topic? Sure. Go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to know if I can get some further comments on you on the increasing tensions between China and Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So the Chinese push back at the notion that there is a clash between China and Vietnam, and they reaffirm that the disputed area belongs to China. Uh, Assistant Secretary Russell, he's currently in the region, and he said that he discussed this issue at length with the Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate on the message that he conveyed to the Vietnamese about this issue? Well, I believe um, he also spoke to this while he was there, which I'm happy to reiterate, and I put out an additional statement uh, last night, or we put out, uh, last night. Um, what sec uh, Assistant Secretary Russell conveyed is that uh, we don't take a, a position on the relative merits of any country's claim in the South China Sea, uh, but it's fair to say, and it's fair to say that both Vietnam and, and China claim sovereignty uh, over uh, that area, uh, but there is a dispute. It's not for us to decide which position is stronger, uh, but at the same time, we believe uh, that all sides should uh, operate in a way that um, reduces tensions. And what we've seen, uh, and obviously this is what we've spoken to, is that the unilateral, de unilateral decision by China to, uh, to uh, introduce its oil rig into these disputed waters, the dangerous conduct and intimidation by the vessels is, is concerning and certainly are, is a representative of provocative actions. And there's been an escalation recently in activity between the two sides. Is there a concern at the State Department that this could continue to escalate? And what is the State Department prepared to do to help resolve the, the crisis? Well, uh, again, obviously, uh, we continue to encourage both sides to uh, take uh, to uh, reduce the rhetoric and uh, and uh, and to uh, pull back on provocative steps that are causing uh, this level of tension in the region. Mm -hmm. The veracity of the video that uh, the, the the Vietnamese uh, foreign ministry showed to reporters, and have you been able to decide which si which ships were the actually the ones doing the the ramming with the hostile the hostile actions? Which ships, in terms of whether they're Chinese which, or which, not? Or? Yeah, whether they were Chinese or Vietnamese, because there's competing claims. You know, each side says the other side started it. So, do you have any kind of independent? I think uh, my, the statement we put out last night and the comments we've given uh, make clear we think it's uh, the Chinese side that is uh, exhibiting provocative actions here. Go ahead. Yemen. Uh, mm -hmm. Any comment on the progress that the Yemeni uh, army has made uh, in his fight with Al-Qaeda, speci especially in uh, Shabwa? Uh, I don't have anything new to offer on that today. Go ahead. Or, so the embassy? Nothing new uh, beyond the statement we released last night. Is it uh, concerning that after having this embassy closed for the better part of six months that the U.S. has had to close it again and make it tougher for Yemeni citizens who might want to do business with the U.S. for any number of reasons, as well as any U.S. persons in country, that it's going to be very difficult for them once again to uh, access the State Department's resources. Well, Roz, as you know, the reason that we are in countries around the world is because we want to be able to communicate with the local populations and provide resources like visa applications and a range of things that we provide. And our preference would certainly be to have uh, the embassy uh, fully open to the public. But we also, our first priority is keeping uh, the men and women who serve uh, safe and, and the local employees safe. And we take every precaution to do that, and that's why we took this step. But we'll obviously reopen uh, as soon as it is uh, possible to do so. Are there any uh, travel restrictions beyond those that had existed already for U.S. staff? Is there any thought of uh, having people leave the country temporarily for their own well-being? Obviously, we don't preview uh, things like that, but we evaluate uh, constantly, and we make that information available publicly when decisions are made. W one more. Uh, 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 any aids that you are providing to the Yemeni government uh, in this fight? Any assist aid? Uh, I'm not aware of any new assistance uh, that we're providing, no. Go ahead. Uh, Cuba, I think you uh, were asked about this yesterday. I'm just looking for an update. Mm -hmm. the, the people who um, were have been arrested in Havana, uh, are they American citizens? I don't have any update on that at this point. Uh, we also haven't been in touch with the Cuban government yet either. Okay. Um, 
South Africa. Mm -hmm. I wondered if you had any reaction on the on the South African vote and um, the news that it looks like the ANC is going to continue to um, be run, run the country. Uh, let me see. Um, uh, well, uh, we certainly, and I would point you to, of course, the Secretary put out a statement the other night on this. We, I will reiterate that we congratulate, congratulate the people of South Africa for exercising their democratic to vote, right to vote in Wednesday's presidential and parliamentary elections. Uh, we look forward to working with the new government of the Republic of South Africa to further strengthen our bilateral uh, relations. Uh, we um, don't have anything really further. Obviously, we're in close touch with our team on the ground. Uh, all right. Oh, go ahead, Ali. Um, do you have any readout of the meetings that Wendy Sherman has had over the last two days in Israel with the U.S. Israel Consultative Group? Consultative uh, group? Let me see if I do, um, and I'm happy to check with our team if I don't. I know that um, obviously Susan Rice is on the ground, and the, the White House has been putting out a variety of readouts. But let me see if I have anything on um, that for you. No, I, I have one on Syria. Sorry, okay. if this was asked. Mm -hmm. um, are you considering supporting a? Um, the UN Security Council authorizing a uh, investigation by the ICC into war crimes in Syria. Mm -hmm. uh, Ali, for you, um, let me check and see with her office if there's more uh, to convey on that. Um, I do have something for you, Elise. One moment. <clears throat> Uh, we do, uh, the United States supports uh, the referral to the ICC set forth in the draft resolution under discussion. Uh, we've long said that those responsible for atrocities in Syria must be held accountable, and we've been working with our Security Council colleagues on a draft resolution toward this end. Uh, we'll also continue to support efforts to gather evidence to hold accountable those responsible for atrocities in Syria. Go Can ahead. You, what uh, changed your mind? I mean, originally you had some concerns about whether this was the right venue to um, mm -hmm. pursue accountability for Syrians? Well, obviously, we can remain concerned, continue to be concerned about the atrocities uh, that uh, we've been seeing on the ground. I don't have any uh, specific incident to point you to, just the ongoing uh, gathering of what we're seeing on the ground. Go ahead. It's been reported that the U.S. made sure that there were uh, mention or there were assurances that none of this would, would ever apply to um, Israeli activity in the occupied territories. Um, is there was there any discussion around that? Um, I can check with our team and see if there's anything specific on that. Go ahead. Just one more for me. Did you have um, any reaction to the killing um, this week in Pakistan of a lawyer, uh, Rashid Rahman, who was defending a university lecturer who's been accused under these blasphemy laws? I have seen those reports. I spoke with our team about it. Um, they were uh, looking into it, um, so let me see if we have more we can say about okay. it post-briefing. Okay, thanks everyone. Thanks for your patience today.